So hello and welcome to today's session in the series of webinars aimed at exploring the data analytics capabilities of the numeric suite of data analytics solutions. The title of today's presentation is Analyzing Batch Process Data, a step-by-step -step guide. And I, the speaker, my name is Lennart Eriksson, and I will uh, try to do my best to convey the message. Uh, before we go into the details of this presentation, let's have a little look of the components or ingredients of the Umetrix suite of data analytics solutions. We have the mod, the software for getting everything right from the start, and we have the easy analytics software for enabling uh, everyday data decisions in an efficient way. Then we have the Simca software for offline multivariate data analysis, and, and this is the software that is also at the heart of today's presentation. Uh, we have the Simca online, Simca online software for uh, uh, deploying models developed in the Simca offline software in a real-time scenario. And finally, we have the control advisor and active dashboard for uh, looking into the future and having a, a good overview of many models that are deployed in different sites. Uh, today's session uh, actually takes place in the, in the transition between Simca Offline and Simca Online, and the remaining three presentations in this series of webinar will then successively uh, address Simca Online, Control Advisor, and Active Dashboards. So sessions 9, 10, and 11 will address uh, these three uh, parts or elements of the Numetric Suite of Data Analytics Solutions. Um, here we have a little overview of today's presentation. We will have a presentation that has three parts, you can say. We have an introductory part where we will discuss multivariate process data, uh, have a look at different tools that are available for uh, analyzing process data blocks, how process data blocks can be arranged and configured. The middle section in the presentation discusses the different data layouts and different data sources from which to pull out the data. And we will also discuss uh, the central concepts in the batch analysis, namely that we have two different types of model perspectives. Uh, one perspective is given by what we call the batch evolution model, and the second perspective, a uh, complementary perspective by what we call the batch level model. After that, um, or having that presentation and, and that background in mind, we are going to look into an application that deals with modeling and monitoring of a batch fermentation process. Uh, those of you that have been uh, attending earlier webinars and perhaps also taken part of our trainings will recognize the so-called Baker's Yeast data set. Um, so let's go into the details then. Um, when you are analyzing process data, you can have access to different types of process uh, information. In the simplest case, you have a set of uh, what we can call process inputs. You are just working with one block of data, and when you have one block of data, for instance, process inputs, uh, the, you're often using uh, the mother method of uh, multivariate prediction methods, which is called principal component analysis. PCA for short. And the objective with uh, this type of models is to try to come up with one or more models that can be used in the monitoring uh, of a process. You want to find out um, if a model can distinguish between good and bad process data, and if so, uh, the hope and the expectation is that a model trained on good process conditions will be able to flag whenever a process is deviating from a normal good development uh, situation. Uh, in the jargon used in, in the multivariate process modeling, any deviation that is detected is, is uh, uh, then interpreted, uh, trying to extract what is known as assignable causes. And if you can interpret such a deviation, uh, you would also be able then to uh, figure out how to avoid such issues in the future. Uh, sometimes you have available a second block of data, and then you can say you move up uh, to a slightly higher ambition level when you have both process inputs and process outputs available. Then data analytically, you would like to find out if there is any information in uh, residing in the block of process inputs that can be informative and predictive of the process outputs, uh, for instance, uh, a quality or, or a yield or a, uh, some throughput parameter. 
when you have two blocks of data, you're moving over to what we call the regression problem, and you will then be working with extensions of uh, the principal component analysis method. And one early extension was uh, or is partial least squares, PLS for short. That was the standard up till about 10 years ago. Uh, more recently, within the last four or five years, uh, there is an alternative to PLS that is called orthogonal PLS, which is uh, often today uh, the preferred uh, regression tool because of the clarity and transparency regarding model interpretation. Um, then we also have all sometimes available an even more complicated architecture of data, and that arises when you're modeling and working with batch processes. With batch processes, you have a two-way data table representing the initial configuration for each batch, and you have also process outputs in terms of the quality or the yield or uh, amount or throughput or tighter or whatever you're measuring after batch completion. But the additional data structure that is often interpretable and rendered as a three-way data structure are the process evolution measurements that are measured throughout the lifetime of the batch. And this is, it, it is it, this particular um, data arrangement that we will be concerned with in this presentation. It is a slightly more elaborate type of data set and it also needs a little bit more complex data analysis, but it is fully possible to, to address and analyze these data using the Simca offline software. So as I have already indicated, we basically divide process data into a continuous scenario and a batch scenario, and of course there are also a gradient or a transition between the two, but the focus here is, is uh, the batch, uh, batch situation. And the, the characteristic thing of a batch process is that we have a, a clearly defined beginning and an end, and that regarding the process evolution measurements, we have a three-way array of data consisting of the dimensions or the modes, batches, time and variables. And as you will see in this presentation, we often work with a combination of principal component analysis and the regression extensions in order to get a good account of all the data that are available or can be available during a batch process um, production. Uh, we are working, regardless of whether we are working with um, a continuous process or a batch process, uh, the basic thing or basic tool underpinning uh, what we are doing data analytical is called statistical process control. The roots and ideas of the statistical process control philosophy go, goes back into the 1930s when Walter Schuhart uh, started to work with this and he, he um, had the view that a process is in a state of so-called statistical control unless a special event, uh, an upset, a hiccup is occurring. And his contribution to this field that he was that he um, realized he needed some sort of tool, some sort of uh, thing to work with, a test to be able to figure out if and when the process is deviating from what is the expected and normal good behavior. So what he did was that he devised a test, the so-called Schuhart control chart, of which you see a representative here in the right-hand part of the slide, with which it was possible to visualize any monitored parameter against the time uh, or the progression of the production. In this Schuhart chart, you usually mon monitor a univariate parameter you have a target value, and with the target value, you have associated upper and lower uh, warning and action limits. For instance, position at plus, minus two, and three standard deviations. And he was then using this, uh, this tool, the control chart, to try to, as early as possible, uh, detect a deviation from a normal, good, and expected uh, behavior of the process. And whenever there was a violation of a control chart or a control limit, I should uh, a control limit of a control chart, I should say, he started to look for what is called assignable causes for the special event. And in the SPC jargon, assignable cause. Uh, means uh, interpreting the occurring deviation and not just uh, interpreting the deviation and observing it, but also trying to figure out how to do corrective action 
what intervention to undertake in order to get the process back on track. And the expected result was then a more robust process performance and, and overall on the long term horizon a, a process improvement. Uh, much later, when the multivariate toolset became available, it was realized that the Shuha chart and also other complementary control charts need not only be used in the univariate setting, but that you could equally well apply it in the multivariate setting by displaying the output parameters from, for instance, PCA or PLS, for instance, by displaying uh, score vectors or associated residual vectors. And then you're taking the step from SPC to multivariate SPC, MSPC. And in the context of batch modeling, often you can see the acronym BSPC, batch uh, statistical process control. And, and here the philosophy is the same as for any continuous process. So the difference between a control chart for the <coughs> continuous process and the batch process scenario is that after a while, you will have many more lines, you can say, in the control chart for the batch process than what you will have with the continuous process. So here we see a batch control chart. It has the same basic ingredients as a control chart for a continuous process. You have the charted parameter, you have the time, and you have lower and upper limits. Often in the control charts in the Simca software, you see a green line, which is the a desirable trajectory representing a good process development. And here we see uh, the trajectory of a batch that has just been completed. So with these um, upper and lower limits, you can say we're defining a process road for normal evaluation. And uh, whenever there is then a violation of these limits, uh, we have a, a deviation from, from a normal good behavior. Down in the lower part, we see a similar control chart, but as I said, we now have the trajectories of several completed batches, and, and that is, so to say, the basic uh, difference between, or could be the basic difference between control charts for a continuous process and a batch process, that if you are running this uh, over time, you can have many uh, lines corresponding to many completed batches in this batch control chart. So this little introductory part then brings us over to a, a more taking a more closer look at different data layouts and data sources. Um, one of the critical steps in batch modeling is to start to figure out what do we want to accomplish. We have to define the process. What, what does the process look like? Do we have just one unit? If we have uh, one or more units, how are they um, aligned? Are, they, uh, are these units in a, in a sequence, you could say? Is there, after some unit, a split into uh, two units? There can also be, after a split, there can also be a merge. So we have to figure out how the process train is looking. We also have to find out if a unit is uh, monotonic, sort of not uh, uniformly following the same uh, mechanism, you can say. If there are changes in the mechanisms, changes in the correlation structures among the measured process variables, maybe it is also reasonable to divide the unit in different stages or different steps or, or different phases. So what does the process look like? That's a very central question. Uh, which part of the process should be modeled? Do we want to model all the units? Do we want uh, one global model across the whole process? Do we want uh, individual models for the different units? Do we want individual models for some of the phases? Apart from those considerations, we also have to consider what sort of information do we have available? Which process tags can we get hold of or process variables, which we sometimes also call them? Uh, we can have starting information and also information at the end relating to quality of, of each batch. Uh, also, the selection of data depends on what the goal is of the process batch modeling. Do we want to have a model uh, for um, process monitoring or process development, you can say. And then there are different selection uh, strategies underpinning, but we will uh, come back to that. Regarding uh, the data, as I told you, there are different types of data. We can have starting configuration information relating to, for instance, set points of uh, 
normal parameters like pH and temperature, but also set points of, of other parameters. We have the process measurements that we are measuring regularly and during the batch evolution. We have controlled parameters. We have we have data relating to actuators, and we can also have parameters that are just, so to say, passively uh, monitored that are consequences of settings of, of other variables. What we, what we call IPC data can also be available. These are measurements that are measured at much less frequent uh, than the process parameters, a few measurements per day or, or so. Um, that reflect the progression of the batch and, and we have to be able to handle the fact that process parameters can be sampled relatively frequently compared with the IPC data. And finally we have the quality attributes. Data can be stored in different places in different scenarios and as I said before on the previous slide depending on the objective of the batch modeling trying to develop a monitoring model or trying to develop a process development model means that we may want to pull out different selections of data. Regardless of what the, the, goal, the modeling objective is, it is important that all the data we're pulling out of the different databases and data sources are correctly synchronized and provided that we are using a transparent and meaningful batch identifiers or face identifiers and, and so on, Simca will be available to align and configure the data appropriately. And data can be made available to the Simca software, uh, both from uh, a, a file, of course, but it can also be imported directly from a process database. In the top part here of the right-hand side of the slide, we see all the supported file formats that are supported by the Simca software. Um, and most databases support an extraction to Excel. So we say as a, as a safeguard, if you can get the data into Excel, you can also get it in, into Simca. And regarding, regarding the Excel platform, you can work also by workbooks. So it means that you can have data <coughs> distributed over several, several sheets in, in the same file. And, and then you can merge and align data during the import. Now, specifically zooming in on the, on the database import possibility, um, Sim, the Simca import will then make sure that the data is presented or organized in a way as, re as is required by the Simca software. And for this to work, we will need an interface what, that is called the Sim API. Uh, and there is a Sim API then that needs to be compatible with each type of database. And, Already today we have several SIM APIs available and of course that, that list and, and that source of uh, interfaces is, is constantly growing. Here is what it will look like once we have started to, to import the data. This is a superficial description. So we will have for a, a batch that is under development, a time order, and we have the variables that are measured. And what we want to do is to start to <clears throat> uh, enable visualization of all these data. In addition to the process evolution measurements, we can also have the final condition data. In the simplest scenario, what we can do in the Simca software is to plot uh, the development trajectory of a single variable here exemplified by carbon dioxide. So we are for one batch uh, displaying how the carbon dioxide is uh, changing across time. If we have a second batch completed, we also can visualize the CO2 for the second batch and for the third batch and the fourth batch. But the problem is that we have so many other parameters. So it after a while it, be, it will become both incomprehensible and impractical to work with the control charts of the individual variables across all the batches. So what we will try to accomplish with the Simca software is a condensation of all the information through these multivariate monitoring tools into fewer control charts that are informative and powerful to uh, help us to both uh, conclude when a batch is developing as it should and also alerting us to any special deviation from normality that can occur. So removing some of the detail, what we have uh, here is a challenge to model the relationship between the process variations 
and the quality, the final conditions across all, across all the batches that are completed. So we can use that information in terms of models to monitoring the fresh, fresh batches as they are evolving. The way we are presenting the data to Simca uh, is as follows. We will have, you can say, two primary types of data tables. We will have a process uh, data table, a process evolution measurement data table, where every row will be a time point at which measurements of all the variables are done for the particular batch that, that we are currently uh, registering data from. So we will have a batch identifier that will connect all the data coming from the same batch. And for the batch data, uh, usually all the parameters are extracted within the batch at the same frequency. The complementary data table is the batch condition data table, and it doesn't have an evolution. Batch conditions can be relating to uh, the situation before the batch is started or launched. Um, here symbolized by a variable with a green color, but it can also relate to the configuration of, of the final, final output, the final result of the batch completion. So we can say you, the batch conditions can be initial conditions and final conditions. So we have the same value that is true for the entire batch. And we will then use different types of selections of these data uh, using different types of models inside the Simca software in order to build up uh, a good overview of the, of the batch data. Uh, providing a little more detail, you can say that what we have for each batch could be one or more parameters representing starting conditions, set points, and so on. Uh, we have the process parameters that reflect uh, the process evolution measurements. We can have also, in addition to classical process parameters, for instance, access to, let's say, spectroscopic data that are measured very frequently, and the IPC data that have a, a less, uh, that is more scarce, scarcely available. And then at the end, we have one or more uh, final quality attributes. So the question is, how do we how do we combine all this data in a meaningful way? And what what we will what we will do when we have a situation like this is usually to develop one model for the process parameters. We can develop another model for the spectroscopic data, and we can also combine these two models in terms of a hierarchical model. And we will also develop a, a separate model for the IPC data, much in the same way as we would handle the situation if a batch is divided into phases. Um, the two models that I'm talking about, um, or were in, uh, I haven't talked about them, but I were uh, alluding to them in the introduction, the batch evolution model and the batch level model will have different types of uh, plots associated with them. And if we start with the batch evolution model, where we have many measurements over time, the primary plot that we are often looking at is the batch control chart, where we are visualizing the development of all completed batches in, in order to define this process road. And after that, we also employ that model uh, in the online scenario uh, so we can uh, evaluate a, a batch under progression, under development. The alternative model, which is based on um, completed batches, uh, will have not all the time points of all the batches as plot marks, but just one single point per completed batch. And this, this allows us to compare completed batches and try to figure out what qualify, uh, what sort of variables uh, will encode a very good batch and what sort of uh, variable correlation structures <coughs> should be avoided so that we, we will avoid uh, uh, less good batches, so to say, and that is the batch level model. Now, to accomplish the first type of model, the batch evolution model, we have the following uh, organization of the data. So we will have data for the first batch from start to completion and all then, then all the measurements. So every row here is a one single time point of, of each batch. Then we have data for the second batch and the third batch and so on. 
In order to give this model a direction, we will need a y variable. Uh, usually this is the time at which the different measurements are made, but it need not be a time variable. It can also be some variable that is very descriptive of the progression of a batch. We would call such a variable a maturity variable or a maturity indicator. And it could, for instance, be the, the amount of ethanol produced during beer brewing. So this y variable is used to give the model a direction and it will uh, eventually lead forward to the batch control charts. In the alternative model, which we call the batch level model, <coughs> we are using a different type of unfolding of the data. So we are now zooming in on the data just for the first, first batch when we are outlining this principle. So we will take the data for each batch uh, we will, you can say, transpose each variable and then realign it as we illustrate here so that the data for a completed batch will now be one single row. So the difference between the batch evolution model and the batch level model is that in the batch evolution model, every row is one time point in one batch, whereas in the batch level model, every row are all the data for each completed batch. So at the end, we will have an X block looking like this. Then we have the opportunity to run two different types of <coughs> batch level models. We can choose just to analyze the X block using normal straightforward principal component analysis because now we have really a two-way data table or we can choose to use the regression extensions PLS or OPLS in order to link uh, the information in the process X block to the process Y block. Are there any relationships between the process inputs and the process outputs? And, and then we are back to these initial slides that I were talking when I were talking about the different types of models. So with this little description of the different models, we will now look into some information on the Baker's yeast example. And after that, we will go in and make a demonstration also of this data set. So the data, the original source is from Gästbolaget. It deals with the production of baker's yeast and the bake, baker here, baker uh, and yeast. Yeast here is, is, is the, the four first letters here in, in the name. So that's yeast in Swedish. We have data available for 33 batches. Uh, there are <coughs> seven process variables reflecting batch evolution and there are five batch conditions. And if we are zooming in on these batch conditions, we have one X parameter, which is the inoculum. That is the initial condition, you can say. And then we have four uh, final batch conditions, quality parameter one and two, amount and yield. And for one of these four Y variables, there is very little data available. So when we're doing the demo in the Simca software, we will just be looking at the three of the four Y variables. The objective here is to show you how to establish a model for normal process evolution. That is the same approach as for a continuous process. And that means that we want the model only to be based on good and well-performing batches. So in the first modeling step, we will try to sort out what is good and bad. Uh, later on, when we have established a model on good and well-behaving batches, we can, in the validation step, use excluded batches that are both good and bad and try to verify that our model can, in the prediction step, distinguish between good and bad. So just as a little repetition, we will be working with two types of data. We have the process evolution measurements where each row is one time point. We have one column representing the batch ID. We have one column representing measurement time and one column for each of the measured process variables or tags, ethanol, temperature, molasses, and so on. Then we have the complementary batch condition data table, this one, where we have one row for each batch, which can include both initial and final batch results. And we have used different colors here just to indicate how the, how the data are um, corresponding to each other. So the first model we will be calculating is the batch evolution model. And again, just a little repetition. This is how we are then arranging the batch data. So we will be using data for 33 
batches and the y variable is the measurement time and we will then use OPLS to fish out the information in the process measurements that change linearly with the time and initially we as I said we will be working with all data and later on we will zoom in on the most relevant batches uh, the good or normal batches <laughs> and when when this model is based on on good and normal batches, the model represents normal batch evolution, which means that the control charts that arises from this model uh, can be used to try to diagnose a, a, a new batch uh, as good or bad. So the main output is that we will be converting the process measurements to score vectors, and we will then be displaying these score vectors uh, in the control charts. The scores are the linear combinations of the original variables and with those we can try to understand why certain batches perform very similar but we can also try to figure out what is the reason for certain batches to be different and, and some batches even to be performing in a bad way. Uh, here we see a couple of the score and loading plots from the Baker's yeast, the initial model based on all 33 variables. You can see that there are essentially most of the variables in the beginning, sorry, essentially most of the batches are uh, inside, but there are some batches with, with very strange uh, and wiggling uh, development trajectories, and some batches are even outside of the, the control limits. Uh, we can use uh, complementary plot, the loading plot, to try to figure out uh, what, what are the characteristics of the different batches, what are the driving forces between a good batch and a bad batch, for instance. We will come back to that. Uh, a complementary um, parameter that we haven't talked about in this presentation, but that we have been dealing with a lot in earlier webinars in this series, webinar five and six in particular, is the D mod X, the distance to the model in the X space parameter. It can, it represents the, the deviation distance from, from any data point down to the <coughs> model plane, and it represents the unmodeled variation. And the D mod X can also be charted in control charts of the batch control chart type. So usually when we are evaluating um, the development trajectories of a batch under development, we would consider not only a score scatter plot, sorry, a score control chart, but also a DMODX control chart. There can be two types of deviations then. We can have a deviation in the score control chart and we can have a deviation in the, in the DMODX control chart. Whenever there is a deviation of a certain or a violation of a certain limit in the control chart, we can use a diagnostic tool that is called the contribution plot to figure out what is driving the deviation. Inside the Simca software, you can make contribution plots both in the score mode and in the DMODX mode. And uh, the, the contribution plots are, are available in, in for four scenarios, you can say. You can you can compare one batch to the average batch. You can com combine a, a part of a batch to a part of another batch. And you can also compare groups of batches with each other. And you can compare individual time points to, to the grand average. Regardless of what, what the implementation and what you're comparing with each other, the final result is a, a, a plot like this, a, a bar chart where the contributions of the different variables are, are visualized. And the basic interpretation is that if the <clears throat> uh, contribution value for, for one variable is positive, it means that for the deviating batch or group of batches, that parameter is larger, numerically larger, than the what is the uh, average of the model. And if the bar is pointing downwards, uh, the numerical value for that particular variable is numerically smaller than for the corresponding uh, average of the model. In addition, we have a, a, a color coding. So the orange color indicates the univariate deviation uh, is exceeding um, three standard deviations. The green color means that in the univariate deviation is within three standard deviations from, from the average. You will see that very shortly. So if we look initially in the score contribution plot, we can see 
here that after about one hour there is a deviation of this light green batch. We can then double click at that time point and open up the contribution plot. If we exemplify here by ethanol, we see that ethanol according to the contribution plot is numerically larger for the deviating batch after one hour compared with the average batch, uh, which is the green trajectory. We can then double click on this bar and open up the corresponding univariate <coughs> control chart for ethanol. And indeed, after one hour, we can see that we are above the three standard deviation limits. So that is why we have the orange color and why we have the positive direction is because we have a high, we have a positive deviation. The <clears throat> numerical value for this variable in ethanol is larger than what is expected for the average batch. If this solid line here would be below the red dashed line, we would still have a, a, a positive bar, but it would be colored by a green color. The alternative and complementary contribution plot is then the DMODEX mode, you can say. And here we exemplify the same thing, that after a while there is a deviation for this batch. We are very far away from the, from the <clears throat> process model. After 10 hours we are deviating. We can then double click. And again, it is, uh, could, for instance, be ethanol that would be uh, deviating. It could be something else. Uh, and we can then drill down to, to uh, a univariate control chart of this type to, to help out with, with the interpretation. Try to find the assignable causes to interpret the deviation. Now, we have also a possibility to, to after a model refinement, use uh, batches that are poor performing or even misbehaving as a way to validate our model. And we see here an, ex an example where we are looking into the control chart based on the training set batches, but we know that this is for prediction batches because if we look very carefully here, we have a PS inserted here. PS is short for prediction set. And we can see that the model that is trained on the good batches, so that the control limits up here and down here, they are based on the development trajectories of good batches. They can definitely diagnose the poor performing and misbehaving batches and also complete failures. Batches that are predicted to be outside the plus minus three standard deviation limits are, are considered as definitive deviators. Uh, those that are within, let's say, plus minus two standard deviations are, of course, there is also a warning flag for those, but they are less risky. And in the lower part, you can see how we can also work with the predicted uh, correspondence of the Demon X control chart. We will come back to this in the, in the demonstration. The important part is that remember that if you diagnose a batch as, as a bad batch, just don't throw it away mechanically. You can actually use it to validate your model. This brings us over to the software demo. So we are going into the Simca software. Uh, we are going to define a batch project. A regular project would be for a two-way data table. We have to use the batch project entry for the Simca software to understand how to unfold the data correctly. If we are working with the omics data, we have a specific entrance in terms of the omics skin. And the same goes with spectral data where we can work through the spectroscopy skin. But now we're going through the, the batch implementation. So we will be importing the data from a Baker's Yeast file. Um, we now have the possibility to <clears throat> define uh, how to import and configure the data in this workbook. You see we have three sheets, process data, start condition, and result variables. And in this case, we want to import them as separate sheets. So we have the result variables, the quality parameter, one and two and the amount, and they were Y variables. So we have to set them as Y variables. So Simca knows that they are final conditions. We have in the block start condition, the inoculum. If we are not saying anything, Simca will by default be in interpreting any column as an X variable. And here we then have the process data, which is the large data table. And you see we have the similar batch ID as we have on the other data sets. Yeah, so all these measurements 
belong to the to the batch called AA. And what we have to do here is to uh, assign a y variable, and we have it here. It is the y variable in this case. Oh, I sorry, I took all of them as y variables. That was a little hiccup. This the other ones are x variables: ethanol, temperature, the flow of molasses, the flow of ammonia, airflow, level in tank, and pH. In the bottom part of the import, we also have an issues pane. It reports no problems for any of the data sets, which means that all the identifiers are in, um, interpretable and uh, synchronized. So we can finish. I will overwrite an earlier uh, file that I did when I rehearsed this a couple of hours ago. We are now inside main Simca and we have three imported data sets. We can always choose to open the process data set and, and, and scroll through it just to verify that the import seems to have gone correctly. So we have all the data for all the 33 batches here, the process evolution measurements. We have a separate table for the start conditions and the result variables. So the import seems to have worked as intended. We will now develop a, a batch model of the OPLS type. One thing that we have uh, access to now, since we have chosen a batch project in comparison with, let's say, <clears throat> normal modus operandi of the Simca software, is that we have access to a batch tab in addition to the home tab and data tab and so on and so forth. In the batch tab, we can then create these specific plots for batches. So we can make a, a score contribution, sorry, a score control chart where we then see um, for a certain batch, in this case AA, we see uh, in the top part the legend. This is the far, one of the batches. It is the solid black line, and I can <clears throat> I can now I am now using the left and right arrow keys on the keyboard just to very quickly skim through all the batches uh, and see what they look like. So we have 33 lines here. Alternatively, I can um, I can choose to plot all batches like this. And so we see them like this. We can make a similar thing for the Demodex plot also. We see all the batches. But after a while, it becomes a little messy, perhaps. But one of the plots, so, so then we can, if we want to, we can also remove uh, batches and go back to the scenario where we are looking at <coughs> one, one batch at a time. It's always possible to, to manipulate uh, all the plots and, and plot one or several batches. It is the same thing. But the, the plot that I was, or control chart that I was really going to look into here in the beginning, that is the variable control chart. So here we have, um, for instance, the control chart for ethanol only for one batch. And we can again use left and right arrow keys to browse through. Or if we prefer, we can again insert and look at all batches. Now, here we are looking at how uh, ethanol is changing for all the 33 batches. And clearly you can see that there are several batches that have uh, clearly deviating uh, profiles for ethanol. In addition to left and right arrow keys, <clears throat> we can also use up and down arrow keys. And when I use that, I browse between the different variables. So we have ethanol, temperature, molasses, ammonia flow, air flow, level in tank, and finally pH. And these are the kind of plots that we recommend to use when starting to, let's say, debugging the data set, removing uh, batches where you have variables with clearly very, very um, conspicuous uh, tra trajectories. And when you're going into that part of debugging and removing things, uh, we have a very useful tool under the Tools tab. We have something called uh, Batch Marking Mode. So I'm selecting Batch Marking Mode, and I can then highlight all the data points that belong to a specific batch. And now I'm clicking on the Control button, so I can start to highlight batches where we clearly have very deviating and, uh, and, and conspicuous uh, trajectories. So they are now highlighted. And we can then, by using the up arrow key, see 
what things look like for temperature, what it looks like for ammonia and airflow and level in tank and pH. And here you see several uh, variable, several batches where you clearly have <clears throat> problems with the pH regulation. We can also highlight those. I'm just exemplifying how you can highlight batches where you have deviations and conspicuous behaviors. We can now exclude these batches by clicking on the exclude button. And then upon doing that, we are laying the ground for a revised batch evolution model, which then has the model uh, number two. We can then calculate that model and start to plot control charts also for that revised model. And you can then do this <clears throat> selection of data uh, in an iter iterative process gradually, uh, slowly and gradually zooming in on the data for the most relevant batches. And, and like a good chef, I have prepared this, so I'm now going to switch to another project where we have developed a number of batch evolution models, eventually leading forward to a situation where we have uh, 16 included batches, it says here, with a, with a very small font size, 16 batches that are good. And we have then deleted the data for 17 batches. And we will now investigate this model, and you can see that <clears throat> the control limits have now uh, sharpened up a lot, so we have a much better alignment and a much better definition of, a, of a, what a normal uh, process development trajectory should look like. We can now use uh, the excluded batches as a way to try to validate this batch model. Uh, and in order to do that, we have to define a prediction set. So now we are operating Simca much in the same way as we would do for any normal two-way data table. And the easiest way to define, in this case, uh, the prediction, prediction set is to say that the prediction set should be the complement work set batches. So it should be the complement to the batches used for building the model which means it is the 17 excluded batches. Once we have done that definition, we can go back to the batch tab and start to use other plots that are of a similar type as for the training set. So we have scores and DMOD X. Now we have scores prediction set batch control chart, DMOD X prediction set control chart, hoteling T-square and so on and so forth. So I'm just exemplifying how you can do that. And here we now see a prediction for the first batch in the prediction set. Then we can again use uh, these arrow keys and, and scroll through the different batches of the test set. Then whenever we see a deviation, we can double click and we can open up that contribution plot. And we can see that after one hour when the, this deviation was occurring, ethanol seems to be numerically much higher than what the model is expecting, and the level in tank is, is much smaller. So we can then double click and open up and see and verify that what we see in the model also makes sense when we look at the original data. And here ethanol is clearly much higher than for the average batch. The final part I wanted to demonstrate to you is how to accomplish this um, complementary model that is called a batch level model. And in order for that to work, you have to select a basis batch <clears throat> level model, batch evolution model, from which to pull out the data. Here I have many uh, batch evolution models, but I will, I will depart from the last model. In order to enable a batch level model, I have to go to the batch tab and select create batch level. I create the batch level, I will work with the data, pulling data from model M8, uh, which tags I want to work with, all of them, uh, and then I will lay out the ground for a PCA model in this case. I'm only looking at the process data. So now Simca has <clears throat> configured the data for a batch level model. And in the batch level model, all the data are now, we now have another data set, all the data have been rearranged and aligned such that all the data for a completed batch are found on the same row in that data set.
So that means that we are now actually able to <clears throat> analyze the data like for any normal two-way data table. So we can develop a PCA model two first components like we do with any normal two-way data model and we will now work under the home tab when we are working with the batch level model we can use the normal uh, tool set under the home tab that we're used to working with so we can take a score plot and the score plot will now show relationships between the completed batches uh, we can also then look for outliers and we can look at the loadings. The loadings have a slightly different touch to them, not meaning but visualization compared with what we are used to uh, when we are analyzing two-way data. We would be expecting a scatter plot here but this is because we are working with batch data. So <clears throat> this plot is called the sources of variation. So it shows how the seven process variables, how their influences is changing across the lifetime of the batch. We have the lifetime here from zero to almost 14 hours. Uh, I, can, I can make uh, an alternative loading plot. I can make a line plot like this um, and just align it side by side. The, the normal loading for all the uh, little review we have, sorry, we have this data table where we have several hundred of variables and when we make a line plot of the loading we see that we have something like uh, close to 600 variables. This is the loading for the first component. We can then color code it. We can color code it by the identifier, the primary ID and just cut out two sections. So here we have a color coding and we take the tool and highlight series. So if we, for instance, look at uh, the um, airflow, which is that segment. So what, what, when we are go what I'm trying to say is that when we are going from the conventional line plot of a loading over to the sources of variation plot, what we are actually doing is just <laughs> segmenting uh, the normal line plot and then superimposing these lines in the same loading plot. So the green segment in the plot to the left shows how the influence of airflow is changing across the 13 hour time span. And that green color to the left is the green color to the right. So you can see how a sources of variation plot is uh, created. It's just slicing of the line plot of one loading and plotting them on the, on, on the same time span, so to say. So going back, we can now use, uh, we go back and create the, the score plot. We, we can look at scores and loadings and demodex side by side and see what are the relationships between the completed batches and what, what, what is encoding a good batch from a, from a really good batch and what is diff making some batches be similar and so on and so forth. So it's normal straightforward interpretations of, of models and, and all these kind of things we have been into in, the, in earlier webinars in this series. So I think this is the last thing in the demo. Let's just go back to the PowerPoint part. So once you have developed a model like this, the, the next step is then to <clears throat> import it and launch it in the Simca Online environment. And Simca Online is then something that we will talk about in the next webinar in this series, part nine. Uh, so we will then show you how you can uh, work with models developed for batches uh, in the online scenario. And finally, then we are also in webinars 10 and 11 looking at uh, <coughs> complementary tools to the Simca Online, the control advisor and the active dashboard. So the whole suite of the Umetrics data analytics solutions is there to help you to analyze these central questions, descriptive questions, what, what happened, uh, diagnostic things, why did things happen? predictive questions, what, what could happen in the future, and prescriptive, the, the prescriptive situation. What should we do to get something to happen, or how should we act to maybe avoid an issue to happen in the future? Uh, the data analytics uh, 
uh, business as part of Sartorius is there to help you with all these kinds of questions. And, and really uh, what we want to accomplish uh, as a mission is to, to drive growth for our users by enabling our customers to, to see what, what others don't. And our vision is that we, we want to be recognized as the leading data analytics solution provider. So as a final slide, uh, through the Umetric suite, uh, the data analytics solutions within Sartorius, what we would like to help our users and, and clients to do is by looking at their data, analyzing their data and extracting the golden nuggets, understand how to change a little and, and thereby grow a lot. Um, so I think that was the last what I wanted to say in this presentation. I thank you very much for your time and attention.